small groups, so if you have questions, feel free to just raise your hand or shout them out, whatever works for you. Um, so this, let me get a survey of the room. How many of you are designers? Okay, how many of you are small business owners? Okay, great. And um, any developers? Okay, and any other categories I might have missed? Just learning, perfect. Great. Good to know. So this is an. Um, so I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Carolyn Thayer. Um, I'm a UI UX designer, and I'm um, a teacher's assistant at Skillcrush.com. I'm based out of Portland, Maine. Um, feel free if you think of any questions to um, hit me up on email or send me a tweet. Um, or I'll take questions after too. <clears throat> so the goals of this presentation, so this is going to be an entry level presentation. Um, before you create a website, you need a plan. <clears throat> you don't want to just open up Photoshop and start throwing around colors and fonts. You need to know what you're doing. It's going to save you time and money. Well, you could just open up Photoshop, but it's going to cost you a lot more money and a lot more time and you're going to have a lot more expensive mistakes. Um, so the goal of this talk is to give you the tools to create a roadmap for your website. Whether you're building your own site, or you're working on a client site, or you're working with a designer or agency, you're a small business, you're working with someone, just knowing the process, knowing the steps you can take before you talk to a designer. Um, this is going to give you a launch point to build a successful website. <clears throat> you might not need to use all of the methods every time that I'm going to talk about, but you'll have like a toolbox that you can reach into and grab something that will fit your project. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is user personas. So I'd like to say that a user persona is a snapshot of a fictional person who represents research done on a major group of people visiting your website. So user personas give you a useful metric to design and critique your site with. So rather than having to remember the details of many users, you're looking at your site through the lens of three to five fictional characters. This tool is really useful then when you have to make sure that a user accomplishes a certain goal, such as buy a product, call a number, find directions. And what makes a good user persona? So a good user persona focuses on your intended audience. While it's possible to have multiple audiences, um, However, if you're asked a question, who is your business targeting, and the answer is everyone, you're not actually targeting anyone. So you want to kind of narrow it down between one and three categories of people who are using your product or service. Um, really knowing your users and their needs is going to help you make effective design decisions. <clears throat> as much as possible, your persona should be based on actual research. So this makes your job easier if it's an existing business or company you're able to do research. It's a little harder if it's brand new. You have to make some assumptions, look at your competitors, but as much as you can not make assumptions or make assumptions and validate them with research, like analytics, or if it's a physical location, surveying people who walk in the door, any of that sort, that's gonna help you out. And a good user persona should be realistic. This one's really important. So while it's okay to be aspirational, um, you wanna keep your decisions based in reality. For example, if you're creating a persona for a nonprofit that typically receives many $25 to $100 donations, um, you don't want to make a persona that's a millionaire looking to give away their life savings. That's not going to happen, and that persona is not going to help you. Um, and personas are also great for creating empathy. So if you say, um, when you're citing making a design decision and you're citing research, Sometimes that's really hard with your stakeholders to create empathy. So you're saying, well, 45% of people using cell phones. But if you have Mark uses a cell phone and you can tell a story about Mark, like he's on the go in his car and he's pulling out his phone, that's going to build empathy and be easier for all your stakeholders to understand. So this is um, <clears throat> a free user persona template I just grabbed off a website. But there's lots of user persona templates out there. They can be super complicated and detailed. They can be very simple. Um, I'll send out a link to this at the end of the presentation. But a good persona is going to help you pinpoint your user's goals. That's what it's going to focus on. What are their goals? A little bit about their demographics. Um, some important things to consider for your persona include what their pain points are and what frustrates and delight your users. Um, and also some general demographic information. Also, because again, we're using these personas to build empathy, 
naming them something like John Doe and making it really generic is not going to build that same level of empathy as just building a more well-rounded persona. So the more you can make them feel like a real person based on a large amount of data, the more you're going to build that empathy and have really want to build a good product for your user. All right. So how do we use these fancy personas, you ask? <clears throat> Having made up um, these fictional characters, we have a snapshot of our key audience. We've built empathy with them. And they're now more than just facts and figures. So here are two case studies, two samples here. Um, this is for an online grocery shopping store. They want to build um, an app or a website. And <clears throat> what they did is they surveyed a whole bunch of their customers. They talked to people. We talked to cashiers coming in. And they want to add an online delivery to their website. So this grocery store looked at their online analytics. They surveyed in-person customers. They talked to their cashiers. And they decided that they have two key personas. We have Joyce here on the left. Um, she's 75. She mostly uses a desktop computer. Um, she's retired. She lives by herself in an apartment downtown. She doesn't drive. Um, she struggles with lugging groceries home. And her goal is to get basic supplies easily without relying on outside help. Something she might say is it's not worth the hassle. And then we also have Laura Smith shopping at the same grocery store. She has an intermediate tech level. She uses an iPhone 8. She's 39. She lives in a residential neighborhood. She has three children. Um, she spends a lot of time driving around. She wants to pay, shop local. And she wants to, uh, she'd pay more for organic brands. And she wants to save time without sacrificing quality. So can anyone think, looking at these, if you had to make design decisions, what are some things you might think of that, based on these that you'd make for an online marketing store or an online grocery delivery service? Yes. Exactly. Um, any other things that you can think of based on these personas that you'd want to make sure your online delivery includes any features for your product? Yeah. That's a good one too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those are all great things. And so through these, we've had empathy versus just saying a statistic of X amount of our users are this age. We now can say Joyce wants this and Laura wants this. Other examples might be um, <clears throat> Joyce might want to have the phone number easily accessible so she can call. Maybe she doesn't want to deal with an online form. Um, <clears throat> so we need to make sure that phone number is easy to find. She also might want a larger font to read. Uh, we also, based on Laura, it needs to be mobile friendly. Um, we probably want a look that says more high quality versus discount. Um, and she might want to click the call button. She might not want to type the phone number in her phone. She might want to just hit a button and place her order because she's in a hurry. So knowing this, if we hadn't had these, we could design a beautiful form, like a beautiful online ordering form with all these complicated things and check boxes and <clears throat> go out there and find that Joyce doesn't use it at all and Laura is in too much of a hurry to click a bunch of buttons and scroll through pages and pages of this complicated online ordering thing. So this is where the, these user personas and knowing who is using and building empathy can really help. All right, next item before you dive into your site is sitemaps. So sitemaps are a way to organize the information and the navigation of your website. After creating a sitemap, you should have a complete um, map of all the pages and subpages on your site. So how do you make a subsite uh, sitemap? My favorite way, super simple, bring it back to the basics, post-it notes. <clears throat> um, one way to tackle your sitemap is to start by writing down all the names of all the pages you'll need on post-it notes and stacking them in rows under the home page of how you feel they should be organized. And then the next step, this is the important step, go through, write down everything that you think. Go back and then edit them. What can you combine? What can you eliminate? What's redundant? And so you'll end up eventually with something like this. So this is for a landscape business. And we have our post-it notes. And you can tell that they start on the home page. 
we have our main navigation. So in the top, we're going to have an about us and our services, a gallery, and a contact us. Um, then they're probably going to have in the format of a drop-down menu, uh, a mowing page, and a snow removal. Um, and the post-it notes and the pen and pencil are great because you can really just move things around. You can shuffle them. You can even add links if you have a navigation in your footer. You can put some down at the bottom. <clears throat> so those are a great way to know before you start building your site, know what pages you have. How many pages? So. Sitemaps are sometimes confused with um, user flows or task flows. So that's something I want to talk about the difference of. Um, user flows, also known as task flows, um, both take the form of flow charts. <clears throat> the difference is in what they represent. So a sitemap is about your pages specifically and the structure of your navigation and your content. A user flow is how a user gets from point A to point B. So I think the great analogy is from uxmovement.com. What they say, is that they state that a site map is like looking at a map of a territory from a bird's eye view with all major landmarks visible on the map. And a user flow is like putting in coordinates for directions on Google Maps. You can see which route to take, where to turn, and the miles it takes to get there. So I know I mentioned user flows. Let's talk about that briefly. So where user flows are really useful, <clears throat> they're useful for applications and larger e-commerce sites. And that's really how we start thinking about going from page to page. What is the process like for our customer, for our user using our site? Um, how many steps does it take someone to put an item in their cart or onboard to create an account? Um, for example, has anyone ever played or watched Zoom, the TV show, the kids show? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen the clip of the peanut butter and jelly game? Or heard of the peanut butter and jelly game? Okay, this is, I wish I put a video in here. So the peanut butter and jelly game is where you instruct someone who you can't see. So you stand like this and you have someone behind you making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they have to kind of play dumb and follow exactly to the letter the steps you take to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And maybe you didn't tell them to open the bread bag. Or maybe you didn't tell them to unscrew the jar of peanut butter. And they do literally what you say, and you end up with like a jar of peanut butter between two slices of bread or something like that because they didn't open the jar. So that's kind of with a user flow, you're trying to think of all of the decisions you're making um, and trying to kind of like play that peanut butter and jelly game where you want to be very specific. And next thing you know, you forgot that that user to put an item in their cart has to click through four pages or something you find or put something in or something that's a lot more steps than you thought of and we're like, we'll just have them check out. It'll be so great. <laughs> so thinking of exactly what your user is doing. Um, let's get that. So when do we need to use a user flow? So user flows are really handy on sites that require its users to complete a task in order to be successful. Um, examples can be creating an account like onboarding um, adding an event to a calendar, putting a product in a cart and checking out, filling out a form to download an ebook. Your user flow should help you see how long and straightforward the process is to completing the task you want your users to take. If the task is too long, complicated, or confusing, you can lose your users on the journey, leaving the goal of your website unfulfilled. If you've ever visited a website that is so complicated to use that it has an entire page dedicated to setting up your account or checking out, then you can empathize with how frustrating that is and see how mapping out the process. You don't want to have instructions for how people have to check out. You want them just to be able to do it. <laughs> so here's an example of a user flow here <clears throat> for a checkout process. And so as you can see, when drawing out all the steps of this is a simple checkout process, there's a lot of steps that someone has to go through for a simple, basic checkout process. Um, looking at this user flow, we can tell that the longest path to checkout is creating a new user account before checking out. That's why having a guest checkout option for users in a hurry is a great option. Um, other options we could consider to offer a shorter checkout process could be having social media sign-in. Um, this can make that process shorter. Um, having a one-page checkout with billing info, billing address, shipping address, and shipping info all on the same pages. I've also seen <clears throat> checkouts with the step numbers on top, so you know you're on step one of three, so they know what's coming up, how long it takes. So creating these user flows is super important because it shows you barriers to your users completing the goal on your site. 
After you create your user flow, you would want to go back to those user personas. So then we're going to wheel it back <clears throat> and go back to um, Joyce and I believe Sarah. And we're going to see, would they be able to do this? Where are they going to stumble or have trouble? <clears throat> and what can we change to make it better for those two personas so they can complete this easily and quickly and painlessly as possible? All right, and the last but not the least step I'm going to talk about is content guide documents. All right, there are many forms of content guide documents. This is another one of those. You can find lots of samples online to pull off. You can make your own. Um, <clears throat> if you're working with an agency, if you own a small business and you're working with an agency, typically agencies will have their own content guide document they want you to fill out um, in their own preferred format. If you're building sites for clients, you really should c create your own custom questionnaire for them to get like the information that's most important for you in your process. Um, a content guide document contains all of the copy that's going to be on your website. This document can be as simple as a Word document with a new page that corresponds to an item on your sitemap. <clears throat> and a super simple content guide document will only contain your headlines and your text. Um, so why use a content guide document? So if you have a content guide, your designer will have an idea, and designers love content guide documents. We very much appreciate this, but they'll have an idea of the size and type of your content. And then they can design your site to meet your content needs and show it off, rather than an empty container that you have to fill. So I think like, if you think of it like a clear vase, if we have your content, we can build this perfect box or container for all of the content. But if you don't have the content and you build and design the whole website first, you then have to kind of smoosh your content in there and maybe it doesn't look so great and that container we built doesn't show it off the way it should. Um, or say you have too little content and we built this beautiful website for four or five paragraphs, you then have this little sad content rattling around lonely there. So. <clears throat> this exercise should also give you an idea of all the images and assets you'll need to provide um, your designer and developer. Um, and most importantly, this step is the step I've seen most hold up the launch of a website. <clears throat> Getting content can really delay the launch of your site and you want to be able to launch that as soon as possible. Um, a site can't launch without content. <clears throat> so getting that together is a great first step. The earlier you figure out what content you have and what you're going to put on there, the sooner your site can launch. Also now, it's okay to tweak it a little bit. It's okay to write something, it's not permanent, and adjust it. But just knowing, like, well, it's gonna be about one paragraph. Maybe a sentence here or two will change. Maybe the wording will change. It's okay, it doesn't have to be set in stone. It is the internet. That's the great part is we can iterate. But getting an idea for what's gonna be on each page is so important. All right, so this is a sample content guide I made up here. Um, very, very basic. We have a page title. What's gonna be on that page? So this is an about us page. We have the content, so this is for a business. So they are on their about us page. So they have a little paragraph about their business. They have who they are and their names. We have a call to action. So they have something they want you to get a quote from them. And then we just have a list. We don't even have the actual files, just a list of the file names that are gonna go on this page. And you can hand this to your designer or your developer and they're gonna know, okay, I'm a designer. I now know that we have one, two, three, four, four images, a small paragraph, and a few names and a call to action. I'm not gonna design a huge page for 10 paragraphs. I'm gonna make sure that this is shown off as we need it to. And you know, it can still be flexible enough. We can add another person. We can take away a person. We have a basic idea of what's going on here. OK, <clears throat> so important question. What if I'm working with an agency? So if you're a small business owner, you're working with an agency, why do you need to know this? You may be sitting here and saying, I'm not a designer. I'm not a developer. I'm having my site built and redesigned. What good is this for me? Do I really need to know this? Isn't this their job? And I think the answer is yes or no, and no. It's kind of a combination. A good web designer and developer, they're gonna do all of this process with you. They're gonna walk you through at least several of these steps. Um, 
And you can hire someone to do all of this for you. But there's benefits, huge benefits, for giving it a first go around yourself. Um, <clears throat> first of all, when you're trying to get quotes, you're calling up agencies and you're trying to get an idea of how long your site will take, how much it'll cost. You're going to have a much better idea of the scope of your project when <clears throat> you know, um, you can say, I have seven pages and this is what's going on. You're going to be able to get a much more accurate quote and maybe it'll change. Maybe it'll be six. Maybe it'll be eight with their recommendation. They're the experts and they can recommend some tweaks to your content. But having that starter part, you can get a much more accurate time quote, a much more accurate money quote. Also, this is your site and your business. So you are honestly going to have the most firsthand knowledge of your customers and your audience. No one knows your customers better than you do. Um, and while as a designer, I can research your customers and make decisions based on the data, you're probably the one who's going to hear the complaints when it doesn't work for them. And you're going to get their phone calls and concerns. And if it's a brick and mortar store, you're going to be the ones, you know their names, you know who's coming in. So you're going to have the most personal knowledge of them. So you're going to be able to influence what as a designer I would be making up and say like, I really know that this person comes in every day and I want to make sure this works for them. Um, also, um, having all this info allows your agency or designer to spend time making recommendations to refine your site and use their expertise to make the site as best as possible with refinements rather than spending lots of time on legwork. Um, there's a lot of time at an agency that can be spent getting down content and hunting it down and making edits and, you know, maybe they make <clears throat> three or four design comps and it's they didn't even need that page. So that's wasted money that you can save time and money by having more information about the product before they make something that we need to completely redo um, so they can focus exactly on what you need. All right. And so I have, I'll, I have not put my slides up anywhere yet, but I'm going to add them, my updated slides so you can download and I will tweet that out if you're on Twitter. Here's the link to resources. But also, oh, do you want me to go back? Did you want a picture of that page? Yeah. And I just realized I talked really, really fast. This same presentation took 40 minutes last time. So feel free to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I honestly just use um, like Google Draw. I, pen and paper is my favorite. I'm a big fan of pen and paper. I think with all the tools out there, both with um, wireframing, um, drawing flows sitemaps, the more you can keep it simple in the beginning, the better it is. It costs, you know, there's lots of fancy apps which are great, but make sure you keep in mind, I see this with my students a lot, um, the tools are supposed to speed up your workflow, not slow them down. And if it takes too much time to learn and slow down your workflow, it's not worth it. So that's why I say whiteboard, pen and paper, stick to the basics first, and then if you find that maybe you're not a good writer or you have to give something to a client, then move into a program that will make it a little faster. But if it's just for you, go for the simple, fast and cheap way. Any other questions? <laughs> Perfect. Has anyone done any of these sites uh, steps before? How have they, has there been a time when you haven't done one and it's like it's not gone well for your project or has gone really well and saved your project? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Do 
Yeah, I would say, so my favorite way to do it, it's, so this is hard. If the business already exists, it makes it a lot easier. It is a lot harder for me when the business doesn't exist. But if you're working with a brick and mortar shop, go in and interview the cus their customers. Like, you know, if it's a give away some free product to see if you can just ask them some questions and talk to who they're doing. Talk to their cashiers. So the people that have regulars, if they know your regulars' names, um, that's a great person to talk to. Who are their regular? Like I worked at a cafe for years and we had one regular who we even had a button for because he ordered the same thing every day. Like you want to know those people who are coming in. You want to talk to the people who are interfacing with the customers as much as possible. Talk to the people if it's an online store who are getting the complaints every day on the phone. Um, who's calling in? What is their biggest complaint? You know, what? get that idea about them. For online, you have analytics, which is great, and you can look at that. Um, and that should give you a good snapshot. But yeah, and then from there, I use like unsplash.com is just a free photography site. And there's some others. Just grab a free photo. Um, and then if, like, say you don't have the opportunity, you're just using analytics, um, see if you can find someone who fits that demographic. So you have an analytics and you get someone in that demographic. See if you can find someone who fits that demographic and talk to them. Um, What's their name? Like, what do they do? Where do they like to look for other websites? What kind of things do they do there in their free time? All right. Well, I will be here if anyone has any questions. You can also um, hit me up on Twitter or email um, and or find me after, and I'll be happy to answer anything. Yeah. <laughs>